Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to another Straight Talk with Duncan Aviation where we're going to be uh, discussing the facts about COVID-19 and some of the ionization systems that we're putting into aircraft uh, these days to help with COVID-19 and some other pathogens. Um, we're going to get started here. We're going to let a little bit of time here to let people start jumping on and uh, but we're gonna get into the introductions. My name is Michael Kuzatz. Uh, I am the Eastern Regional Avionics Sales Manager here at Duncan Aviation. On the call also, we've got John Spellmeyer, who is the Western rep. And John, I was just thinking about this. So John has flown B-52s, B-1s uh, for the Air Force. John, when did you join the Air Force? Oh gosh, 1985, <laughs> 85, 86, long time ago. Nah, that's not too bad. All right, thanks for jumping thanks. on. Yeah, thanks for everybody for joining us today. Yeah. Also on the call is Dr. Rachel Sippy. Rachel, are you there? Yes, sir. Sounds good. Rachel's got her PhD in epidemiology and has been doing microbiology for 15 years. And Rachel, I know you're not that old, so I have a feeling you have been interested in this form of science for a really long time. Yeah, I, I um, you know, worked in labs all throughout college and then um, worked uh, in mostly in university settings, but also some some private industries as well before I decided to go back to graduate school. And I did a master's in public health and then the PhD in epidemiology. And you make it sound like you were just sitting in a lab enjoying yourself, but I do believe you spent some time down in South America Probably yes. a hot, humid, not so clean lab setting, maybe. Uh, yeah, the <laughs> the lab conditions. I I did. I've been doing a lot of field work and um, clinical research in Ecuador, and there are a lot of limitations for <laughs> um, working in labs there. It's harder to get supplies. It's harder to keep everything clean. So yeah, that's always a concern of ours. Wow, I bet. Well, thank you for jumping on with us. Mm -hmm. And also we've got Jonathan Saltzman uh, with, uh, we call him ACA, but the Aviation uh, Clean Air Partners. And we've been working with you guys closely as uh, we've been installing your product. And, and you, you were, so you guys were one of the first companies to put an ionization system on aircraft. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, we started the company in 2012. Uh, and shortly after the in inception of the organization began uh, manufacturing and installing it into aircraft. One of the first aircrafts we actually installed in it was the 737 BBJ uh, and had very, very positive results. And since then, we've started installing them uh, since 2015 in a multitude of aircraft from small citations all the way up to we've got large wide bodies that are having systems installed now and uh, many, many, many private aircraft, Gulfstreams and Bombardier products and Learjets and the whole gamut. Yeah, well, it's uh, it's pretty interesting technology, and obviously we're gonna we're gonna hit all that today. Quick, uh, what we're gonna be doing? We're gonna talk about COVID nineteen and uh, and other dead, deadly viruses, and just a little bit about what COVID nineteen is. And I know there's been a lot of questions and, and theories, and probably a, an amazing amount of misinformation about the virus, and also how ionization systems work. It's all down on the microscopic level, so it's difficult to get our head wrap around it. And then uh, finally, we'll talk about the uh, ACA Clean Air Ionization System. As a reminder, down on the right-hand side of your screen, you've got a little chat bar. And don't forget, uh, you can send us a question at any time. And uh, several of, of us are looking at that. So if it's a pretty easy question, we'll just respond back to you quickly. And uh, otherwise, we've got the questions uh, section of the presentation at the end, and we will go over everything at the end to uh, answer those questions. So jumping right in with uh, Dr. Rachel Sippy, we've talked about you know, how the coronavirus is similar to other viruses um, like MERS and SARS, but I, it seems like we're also learning a lot as even, I mean, we've talked a few times here in the past few weeks and it seems like we've learned even more here in the past few weeks. What can you tell us on that? Yeah, that certainly is true. So, um, you know, we are learning more as each day goes by. That is something that we are, we're going to continue to study this particular coronavirus for many years to come. Um, and I say this particular coronavirus because there are actual 
there are lots of coronaviruses. There are, are four coronaviruses that actually just get transmitted all of the time in, in humans, and they would just cause what we would call the common cold. And then um, there are uh, now three coronaviruses that have actually caused uh, more widespread epidemics and um, can have much more severe symptoms, including death. And so the, like the two that you had mentioned, MERS emerged in about 2012 and was, you might recall, was based primarily in the Middle East and had been transmitted to humans from camels. And then the original SARS uh, emerged in 2003, and that was spread. It originated in Hong Kong, but then spread out of the country um, with some travelers, but then uh, faded from from transmission after that. And then there's the current coronavirus, which is called a, which is being referred to as um, SARS coronavirus two, because it has uh, some similarity to the SARS that we had seen previously, and also it causes very similar uh, clinical symptoms in the patients who are infected with it. And here in the past few weeks, I mean, I think there's been a lot of discussion we've seen as far as transmission. Um, I don't know, if I'm, I'm kind of probably catching me off guard here because there was some you know, discussions, you can't pick it up from a surface, you know, people who aren't showing symptoms, you can't seem to get it from them. And I, we've heard this, but I'm curious if you can sort what's real and what's not on that. Yeah, and I think uh, you're pro we're probably hearing a lot of different information because you know this question is is really difficult to answer. Um, you know, in in something that is ongoing, and uh, you know we're experiencing we're all experiencing this pandemic, and when you're studying something in humans, we're kind of limited in that you know we can't infect people on purpose and then go and see what happens under you know, kind of perfect conditions right. in the way that you could if we were studying something something else. Um, so we kind of just have to watch what happens and then keep track of people and then kind of study these natural infections. And so you have to be collecting data really carefully and, um, you know, following transmission chain. The transmission chain is something that can be really important. So you want to try to keep track of you know where people go what right. how much were they touching surfaces do they remember um being in a certain place and you know trying to figure out where they picked up an infection and when did that actually occur can be really hard because you know we don't we don't know when we got infected and you know if we're just relying on somebody's memory then a lot of times that that can be really really biased so that makes yeah. it difficult to kind of pinpoint and you know you can do some experimental studies like um you know there's a lot of research on kind of air droplets and particles and the size of the droplet and so we can do studies where we show you know this virus is able to travel a certain distance in a in a droplet of this size um, and do that kind of under a laboratory setting, but then, you know, what happens in the real world is always going to be a little bit different. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, our, our knowledge is being updated all the time. <laughs> so. Right, I bet. And obviously it's kind of a requirement for you guys to try to figure it out. I'm just mm -hmm. curious, I mean, between like the other viruses and compared to the COVID-19, do you have a rough idea, like once the virus is out of the host, and obviously mm -hmm. I know it, it I'm, I'm going to ask how long it lives, but I know it depends on if it's in the sun, if it's in the shade, how yeah. hot is it? I mean, yeah, it, I... it depends. Yeah, it depends. That's probably the best answer I can and I can give you. Right. We do believe that it is able to survive on surfaces maybe a little longer than um, some other viruses, and that might be contributing to its ability to get transmitted. Um, actually, so for this, this virus particularly is not even maybe in the top 10 most infectious or most contagious really? viruses. Yeah, so measles is the top, oh. the most contagious virus that we've ever encountered. And so 
that's something that you measure um, with a number. It's called an R naught, and so that's something you've probably seen in the news. And that's basically a measure of okay, you, um, for each person that gets infected, what's the average number of other people that they are going to infect? And so, the number that we're seeing for this current coronavirus is about you know two or between two and three, kind of depending on the setting. Okay. And you know that changes over time because um, it depends a lot on kind of what we're doing as humans. Um, but we think that one of the reasons that we're able to um, that this virus is spreading is it, not that it is inherently more contagious because, like I said, it's not even one of the most contagious viruses. It's that um, for it does have a couple characteristics in that um, when somebody becomes infected with this virus, you build up a big, what we would call a big viral load. So your body produces a lot of virus and you're shedding a lot of virus, but it, that reaches, you kind of reach your maximum viral load, your maximum infectiousness before you even know you're sick. And, and that okay. is different from other viruses for something like, I would say for flu, flu is similar in that way and that you okay. are, you're most right around the time you first become symptomatic, but for other viruses, you maybe reach that, that peak later on after you've already been sick for a couple of days. And so all of these people who are actually very infectious, they don't know they're sick yet. And so they haven't, you know, they're not under quarantine, they're out interacting like normal because they don't know that they're they're ill yet. And so that's a really easy way for a virus to spread to a lot of people is that it is out and right. just getting getting all over everything. Um, Do we know how really roughly easy. long, I mean, that, that, that uh, when they're asymptomatic, do we, uh, with the COVID-19, do we know how long someone's gonna be, I mean, of course it varies, but roughly is it a five day thing? Yeah. But yeah, it's about five to six days. That is going to vary person to person. We do think that people who are older, maybe that period of time lasts longer. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, it could be up to a week. Um, wow. People who are totally, people who never get symptoms are actually very, are relatively less common. Um, and so... Okay. Um, yeah, it, there is a good period of time where someone right. could be out in the world um, un, unknowingly spreading virus. Right. And so, okay, yeah, that's new information. We have, I mean, we've talked a few times about the virus loading. So, mm -hmm. uh, but let's keep moving. This is really good information. Yeah. So now we, we come, so now we, now we got the virus out there. We've talked about, you know, there's a lot of ways to neutralize these viruses. Mm -hmm. And we've talked about ionization systems and chemicals and, and I know we've we've listened to other webinars where there's formaldehyde foggers and hydrogen sure. peroxide foggers, and, uh, and so it's again, it's this. It's what's the best way to take down or neutralize or kill the virus without like <laughs> poisoning ourselves with all these other systems? <laughs> right, right. So that's that's the caveat is you know depending on the 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 context or the environment you. You know, we have several options to to neutralize viruses, and like you said, that could be some kind of chemical agent, like you know, bleach or um, you know, alcohol is something that you know is in our hand sanitizer that that we use. But um, you know, if we're talking something about like a a large area or um, a room, for example, then you want something that could get out on all of the surface surfaces in a relatively quick time period. And so then you might be looking at something like an ionization system or, you know, radiation is something yeah. that you could theoretically use, but I wouldn't actually recommend that anybody do that. <laughs> um, and so it, it, it kind of depends on what we need to get done. And so when we're looking at neutralizing viruses, you you basically need something that is going to um, attack or destabilize the integrity of the virus structure itself. So 
most viruses, you you have what we would call an envelope. So if you think viruses come in all different shapes, but just right. to kind of think of a ball and then inside of that ball is hollow and on the inside is where kind of all of the genetic material is. It would be the DNA or the RNA of the virus. Okay. And that ball, that, that envelope is that made up of proteins and lipids and, you know, b various other um, uh, mo molecules. And so if we can get something that will um, rupture that envelope, we'll, then, you know, you're exposing all of that internal material, that genetic material that is not supposed to be exposed to the world. It's not, it may not be you know, stable out when it's exposed to the elements. And so if you're able to rupture that virus envelope, then the virus can't function anymore. The envelope is usually how the virus, it needs that envelope in order to infect a person. And so if that envelope isn't functioning anymore, then the virus isn't, it's no good. So. And so, and that's where like the ionization system works fairly mm -hmm. well with that, correct? Yeah, so with something like an ionization system, then, you know, an, an ion is, you know, totally natural. There's ions in the air right now. There's a lot of ions in the air after a thunderstorm because it's generated as part of, you know, lightning striking surfaces. Ions are just, you know, electrons and um, they're generated all of the time as part of natural processes. And so an ion um, basically when you have an enveloped virus and an ion is interacting with the virus, then usually, you know, what is happening is it would be attaching to one of those proteins or one of those lipids that are on the envelope surface. And if you think of those, each of those proteins, think of them as like a Jenga tower. Um, so basically if you knock out one of those blocks, the whole thing falls apart. So proteins are, can be very stable until you take away one piece and then all of a sudden it doesn't work anymore. And so if an ion is coming into contact, it'll maybe steal one of the, the electrons or one of the um, ions that it will steal one of those pieces from the, the protein and then that protein falls apart and the entire envelope becomes destabilized. And that's a pretty quick process, isn't it? I mean, it does, it's not like this, it's not like a, an hour's days type of thing. No, 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 no. I mean, this is, these are um, <clears throat> chem chemical processes that are occurring all the time. They occur pretty instantaneously. And so, you know, if you add, you know, vinegar and baking soda, you see an instant reaction. And that is the same type of reaction that hmm. is occurring on a molecular level. Okay, cool. Um, what else do we have? Oh, yeah. So we're talking, obviously, I mean, as you've well known, as you've been dealing with us aviation guys, like, we don't know anything about viruses. And all of a sudden, like, the whole world is trying to learn about viruses. Yeah. And it was, you know, in the early days, everyone's, you know, again, they thought COVID-19 was just a brand new virus. And mm. it turns out mm. it wasn't. But again, I know, I mean, you've been in this industry for a long time and it's, it's not just COVID-19. It is influenza. It's sort of, I mean, there's, there's a lot out there that we probably should have been, I'm guessing we probably should have been a little more aware and, and thinking about this over time. Yeah, I mean, this is something that in in my field, we are talking about this all of the time. Um, throughout my education and throughout all of my time working, we're constantly talking amongst ourselves about what's going to be the next big one. Um, and just kind of theorizing and doing our best to, you know, collect data and study across the globe and kind of do do what we would call surveillance where we're just kind of continually testing um, people who maybe have weird symptoms and we try to say is this something new or is just they just have some normal infection right. and and that's something we're trying to do all of the time so that we can maybe come up with a better prediction or on when another big pandemic is going to happen or better preparing ourselves um you know as yeah. a country and internationally and so you know influenza is 
I think was something that people suspected as, you know, the next big one will be an influenza because we knew that it had happened before in 1918. Um, that was a, a major pandemic that occurred and killed millions of people. So, you know, influenza was on the list. I think um, anything respiratory is easy to to put on that list of what could the potential next big one be because they're just spread so easily. Respiratory viruses just, you know, we're breathing in them right. everywhere. They can survive on surfaces. They, you don't have to be that close to somebody in order to, you know, breathe a virus into their personal space. Um, and so I'm not surprised that this current pandemic is a respiratory virus. Um, but yeah, that's something we're always trying to keep an eye out for. And, you know, it is a reality that we live with. And this is this area of research would be emerging infectious diseases. And, um, you know, they, they are on the rise. That is um, something that has increased in frequency over the last 20 or 30 years, I would say. Really? There so are a there's, lot of, yeah, okay, so there there's more coming out. That. Uh, yeah, constantly. I mean, it it just depends on um, whether is this something that stays kind of local or does it spread to other countries? Does it cause really severe de disease or have a very strong impact on people's health? Um, so, yeah, does the general public notice that it's happening or not? And, you know, there's a lot of reasons why that may or may not happen. So. Gosh. Okay. Yeah, that's a lot of good information there. Um, so, John, I, John Stallmeyer, I know you've been working with the guys at ACA for quite a bit, yeah. and on their installations, and uh, so it's kind of a, kind of a carryover with all the information we just got from Rachel on kind of how we deal with this on the on the airplane level. Sure, sure. This is kind of scary stuff, you know. Um, I've been doing a lot of reading the last few days preparing for this. And, you know, we're one major mutation away from a a bad virus you know funny i was if you've ever seen one of the latest planet of the eight movies where it starts out with a pandemic it kind of takes on a new meaning after the last six months so hey with, yeah seriously so um with that jonathan you're our chemist our aca chemist and principal with the company um can you explain in layman's terms for us stupid pilots how this technology is destroying the virus, as Dr. Sippy was discussing. Well, thank you. Uh, just as Dr. Sippy said, um, you know, ions are created in the atmosphere naturally. Uh, it comes from uh, lightning bolts, comes from wave move, waves moving, uh, comes from waterfalls, tree movement. Um, there's a lot of different forms where ions are natural in the environment. And basically, we, on an average, you'll get six to 800 ions per cubic centimeter uh, just in normal outside environment. If you're under a waterfall or around a waterfall, you might see 15,000, 20,000 ions per cubic centimeter. In fact, one of the largest generators of single source ion generation uh, is Niagara Falls, where typically they'll get 100,000 to 150,000 ions per cubic centimeter on an average basis. Um, our system actually creates both positive and negative ions. It's bipolar or needlepoint bipolar technology. Um, and there's benefits to both the uh, negative ions and positive ions. Uh, the negative ions primarily uh, will be the ones that will attack pathogens, allergens, uh, contaminants, uh, viruses, bacteria. And as doctors, this doctor kindly stated that um, it severs the bond around the skin of the, uh, or the protein of the, uh, the virus. Um, and by severing that bond, it creates the uh, the pathogen from no longer becoming infectious. It can no longer um, self-duplicate and replicate. So uh, by by neutralizing that pathogen, which will eventually die off now, uh, but more importantly, as soon as it's neutralized, it's no longer infectious. If you were to take one of those uh, neutralized viruses and plant it in someone's lung, um, it would just die off. It wouldn't duplicate. People get sick because uh, pathogens, viruses, uh, self-replicate and continue to grow throughout somebody's system. So the ion ionization keeps that from, from happening. With our system, uh, it, it 
gets installed inside the uh, ECS ducting of the aircraft or the air conditioning system and distributes these positive and negative ions equally throughout the aircraft. The positive ions also have a major benefit by what's referred to as agglomeration. Uh, agglomeration, the positive ions will, will coagulate, if you will, around uh, airborne dust particles. And uh, the dust particles then become too heavy and they fall out of the breathing zone. Um, that, again, uh, helps in several different factors. One, by removing the particulate out of the air, not only is it making it clearer for the occupants to be able to breathe, but uh, those particulates are what pathogens usually latch on to to become airborne. Pathogens in general don't have wings. They're not like mosquitoes. They can't just fly away. They have to have some form or source to be able to uh, become aerosolized or to move through the air. So with the ACA system, uh, we're not only attacking the pathogen itself by uh, neutralizing it, but we're also removing its vehicle, if you will, of particulate out of the air to keep it from being able to be transmitted uh, via aerosol uh, by aerosolizing and, and attacking or attaching to some of the airborne particulate. Um, with the way the system is installed inside the aircraft, you'll get a distribution widely throughout the aircraft. Even on aircraft like Gulf Streams that have a very fast refresh rate, the ionization is still flowing, flowing through and anywhere the air can get, the ions are present and the air and ions are now uh, neutralizing anything that's on any of the surface or airborne that could be uh, contaminated. Somebody sneezes, somebody wipes their face, they touch an armrest. Uh, the ionization is continuously working and the ions are continuously being produced to neutralize those pathogens that could be on the surface uh, where somebody had touched that may be infected. As doctor stated, a lot of times people are, are ill, but they're not even aware that they're a carrier or that they're providing uh, these pathogens in a, and exposing others to them, our system will continuously operate to ensure that those pathogen transfers are minimized. Uh, it would take somebody sneezing in their face uh, for a pathogen transfer, but if they were touching something, uh, eating something, and there's uh, pathogens on the surface, uh, preferably, uh, you know, pr excuse me, primarily from touch uh, or from body fluid transfer, those ions are continuously working to neutralize those pathogens to keep them from being infectious. So if somebody else does touch it and then touch their own face, they won't be able to become infected. Hey, Jonathan, am I going to notice any different feel in the cabin? Is you know, there's, there's, more? there's some, st there's some studies that have been done for positive ions specifically that show that uh, it actually creates a feeling of well being. Um, so if you get some cranky crew members that uh, that that are on board, they they may actually become nice crew members. So can I get one of these gadgets for cranky people? <laughs> and will you sh will you show me what one looks like? Can we go to the next slide? I want to see this ionization. Oh, do we do we have a picture of it? Can we go to the I'm, next slide, Eric? Or sure. do you want to talk to this real quick? Jonathan? So that's. Uh, either way, um, so the airborne unit, uh, that's the, the pic image of our airborne unit. We also have a ground unit, a ground unit that can be utilized as a portable to be able to move around. And we've taken our basically our same certified airborne system and installed it into a high pressure fan uh, that allows you for portability. Our airborne system, which has become ex extremely, po extremely popular, um, gets mounted in the aircraft, aircraft ECS ducting. Um, and it's positive. It's constantly producing positive and negative ions. Again, that's there. We refer to it as a needle point bipolar ionization because we're producing equally both positive and negative ions. One of the other benefits that we find as a sort of a happy byproduct is it reduces static electricity because the static electricity will also uh, the ionization will also neutralize static electricity. I was wondering about that. Yeah, our airborne system gets mounted in the ECS duct and gets distributed throughout the aircraft. So anywhere there's air movement in the aircraft, ionization will take place and we'll be able to neutralize any pathogens that are that are on board the aircraft. Um, that previous slide that we we're showing, uh, this goes over some of the different uh, pathogens that we've tested against, both viral as well as uh, mold and uh, bacterial. And we showed different times. And while the doctor was 100% correct that the uh, neutralization process that happens immediately, we look at both the non-infectious rate of the pathogen, how quickly we can neutralize the pathogen, but also how 
quickly we can get 100% kill rate of the pathogen as well. People often want to know what the what the die off rate is, but it's actually the um, the neutralization rate that's even more important because having a bunch of pathogens, sort of like the sterile med flies, having a bunch of sterile med flies does does uh, not harm anyone because they're not capable of causing an infection into somebody. Once that that uh, virus uh, becomes non-infectious, it's basically inert. It will no longer be a threat to other people. How long does it take to disinfect the aircraft once you turn the APU on and get air moving in the airplane? So there's certain viruses that that and bacteria primarily that are a little bit more stubborn. They've got a little bit, a little stronger outer shell, and they take a little bit longer to neutralize. Uh, the the actual process happens almost immediately, and certain pathogens are starting to be decontaminated and, and neutralized immediately. Certain pathogens like tuberculosis, uh, which is a very, very hardy, or Legionnaire's disease, which is a very hardy uh, pathogen, they can take many minutes to be able to be neutralized, while other ones become in seconds. In fact, we recently tested towards uh, the SARS virus and had some very strong results, and we're currently testing this week in an aerosolized version an aerosolized version, excuse me, of the SARS virus as well, the SARS-2 COVID-19, um, to uh, to show the effectiveness and the efficiency rate of neutralization based on ion levels. So we're actually graphing out uh, the the kill rate and the neutralization rate based on ion levels. You've mentioned the carry-on, the portable device. Um, could you use that to disinfect a hotel room? We do. In fact, we have a lot of operators that ask that exact question because they'll have the airborne system on the aircraft, but they'll also bring the, the ground unit um, and the principal will take it with them to the hotel room or the crew will take it and decontaminate their room. Um, we recommend between 30 minutes and an hour. In one hour, we know that the uh, all of the potential pathogens that are inside the room are neutralized. But again, many of it happens just in a, a matter of minutes. Uh, but most certainly you can take the portable unit with you, take it into the hotel room, decontaminate everybody's uh, hotel room uh, prior to uh, going to bed. So you you minimize your risk of, of contracting something from a neighbor that or uh, another occupant that was there the night before. Yep, as we know, certain, certain, certain services, as, as the doctor was saying, do uh, manifest the, the viruses and pathogens longer than others. Um, recently, I read, I think it was last week, there was a, a study released about the effectiveness of this technology against COVID-19. Did we manage to get a slide put in here about that study? There, Maybe the next slide? Perfect. You, can you talk to this, Jonathan? So we did uh, uh, a surface lab test of our specific systems, both our airborne and our ground system, we showed that in 30 minutes, we were able to, to kill, actually kill, not just neutralize, 99.4% of the viruses. Uh, we actually had a kill rate in, in 10 minutes of 86.4%, if I recall correctly. Um, and, but we actually showed neutralization within a matter of a couple of minutes. We also did it at higher ion levels and uh, showed actually a higher kill rate uh, at, at a faster level as well. This week, as I said, we're we're using a much larger BSL-3 uh, laboratory that's a 20-foot container, a 20-foot by 8 by 8, and we're actually simulating an aircraft interior. We're putting seats in it. We're putting structure in it. We're aerosolizing. Uh, we have several different test points throughout the interior uh, with the virus as well as with um, uh the, the the various areas, tables, seats, whatnot, different surfaces, uh, different material surfaces, so we can actually test what the effectiveness and efficiency is uh, throughout an aircraft, actual aircraft interior environment. You know, I wouldn't be surprised to see the materials that are used inside an aircraft change because of this, more effectively cleaning them and those kind of things. That's very possible. You know, we're, we're the regulations because of uh, obviously burn uh, require us to use protein-based fibers uh, or hard surfaces which aren't able to burn. There's some uh, uh, different studies that have been done based on being a protein-based fiber, the wool silks, leathers that we use uh, versus the the hard surfaces, the the stainless steels which are 
uh, from what I've read and what I've studied, uh, stainless steel is actually the surface that is able to, to harbor the, the virus the longest. Um, but there is a very good possibility that we may see a changing future to different materials to uh, help to deactivate this. As you've both stated, um, you know, we're just one small little mutation on, a, on uh, uh, the normal influenza virus. Uh, just a very small mutation away from having a very serious pandemic. The current pandemic that we're experiencing is nothing compared to what has been experienced in history uh, through more common viruses like an influenza virus that is more easily transmitted and can become very, very, very deadly to millions and millions of people. Uh, you know, this has been a problem that's been around for a long time. ACA recognized this issue uh, in 2012 and, and formed the company specifically for this. Unfortunately, it took a pandemic for the world to realize that there was such a strong issue. You know, we've always talked for years, I'm sure everybody's read and seen the different reports that, uh, that, that are in magazine articles and newspaper articles calling airplanes Petri dishes, the flying Petri dish. Uh, this is one of the reasons why ACA was formed. Uh, to neutralize that petri dish and to make that petri dish inert. Uh, but again, there's a lot of other benefits with the system, uh, with agglomeration of getting out particles, making the air cleaner that we breathe. Uh, particle sizes, the smaller the particle, uh, the more deep it goes into your lung, into the alveoli of your lung. Um, and with our system, we're actually able to immediately see a drop in uh, particle count when we've done any testing on board aircrafts, within seconds, we see a drop of 40, 50, 60% of a particle count within the air. And that's down to uh, uh, submicron levels. Um, uh, the coronavirus, the COVID-19 virus, uh, this particular virus right now uh, has been measured at about 0.125 microns. Um, the, uh, the advantage of our system, again, even submicron size because ions are microscopic. They're able to agglomerate around all sizes of particulate and remove them from the breathing, breathing zone. Well, you guys certainly had the right product at the right time. Um, we're coming up on, we're actually a little bit over our, our 30 minutes. Could you quickly summarize um, the key benefits of this? We've done quite a few installs over the last couple of months. So I'm going to say 15 or 20 Gulf streams, bumper air aircraft, Falcon jets. Um, so there's definitely a lot of interest out there. We just want to get the facts out to people. And if you could summarize real quick. The sure. Points, well, I'd appreciate absolutely. it. Absolutely. Well, you know, one of the, the major benefits of our system is it's it's not related to any human error. We don't have any human error because it automatically it activates it proactively as soon as the aircraft is turned on. As soon as the packs come on and the air system is is. Uh, turned on, our system is energized. So there's no human error. We don't have to worry about uh, some of the other issues that you might have with chemicals or with lights using uh, to try to neutralize where we, we don't have the issues with um, shadowing, for instance, or somebody missing an area. Um, our system is safe for all surfaces, for people, for food. You can be on board the aircraft, obviously, while the system is energized and is working. Uh, so there's no negative down, downside or negative effect. In the old days, uh, ionization was also coupled with ozone uh, because of the way that the system was generating ions. Our ion, our, our system is actually patented. It's one of the form, the basis of the formation of our patent is that we do not create any ozone. We operate at a level that we don't touch the oxygen molecule. We don't harm it in any way. So we don't create O2, which is oxygen, into O3, which is ozone by uh, oxidizing the oxygen. Our system operates at 12.0 or less uh, electron volts, which means that we don't touch oxygen, which is at 12.7. So we're able to clean and decontaminate an entire aircraft interior uh, anywhere that there's air. It continuously works from the time you turn the system on till the time you turn the system off, including when you're taxiing, when you're sitting on the ground and you're waiting for passengers to arrive, um, the system automatically will engage. Uh, there's, we also have the ability to uh, have a uh, enunciator panel so you can see that the system is producing ions. One of the key benefits is our system doesn't require any maintenance. Uh, our current BTML is 87,530 hours. 
Um, so we expect to outlast the life of the aircraft. Um, and it's very easy to install. Uh, Duncan, I believe you guys can install it in just a couple of days. Uh, it more depends on your capacity uh, than your capability because you guys are able to quickly and efficiently put it into the aircraft. Um, this system uh, is unique. It's not like anything else on the market. There's no uh, no other system that can can make the, the same effects and have the same results as our ionization system. Perfect. Thank you. Hey, um, we're getting a few questions coming through here. And if I don't get to your questions, probably don't have time to get them all. I think I'm just going to pick one out here. But if we don't answer your question on here, we'll get back to you with an email to answer your question. I had an interesting question here from Lewis, and I've, I've seen this in other uh, document, other things, news I've been reading. Why not put UV lighting in the air conditioning ducting system as opposed to ions? Uh, UV lights have, have a completely different effect. There's, there's, there's some issues with UV lights specifically. UV light will operates on a wavelength, and that wavelength has a specific wave to it. And with that, uh, to be effective for a UV light, you have to be within that wavelength. Let's say it's 100 centimeters to 120 or 220 centimeters, excuse me. Uh, the UV light itself would only be effective within that uh, specific range. Uh, anything outside that or anything inside that, it's ineffective, unfortunately. Uh, UV lights are also very expensive and they have a very short shelf life. They are only operational for a certain amount of time. And then they're also very difficult to dispose of because it's toxic. Uh, the benefits uh, and, and people can't be around it. Um, there are some new, new studies for some new types of UV lights where they're saying it's safe for people, uh, but there's still a lot of unknown on that. Uh, but the biggest factor is shadowing. Uh, if you have an area that's uh, like an armrest uh, that's uh, out, on the outside of the arm next to the aircraft seat and the aircraft sidewall, uh, the UV light doesn't get to that point where somebody rubbed their eyes, puts their hand down on the armrest, and then that pathogen will continue to live on. Again, our system, because it's moved by air, anywhere there's air, there's ionization. That makes sense. Hey, Jonathan, thank you. Um, Michael, if you want to close out here, I'll pass it on to you. Yep, sounds good. Um, just a little bit about Duncan Aviation. I'm not sure how many of you guys know about us, but, you know, you've heard about us, most of you, you know, based out of Lincoln, Nebraska, Battle Creek, and Provo. But we have 31 facilities across the United States, and we are doing a lot of these ACA installations um, at our satellite facilities across the U.S. So no matter where you're based, we probably have a facility close to you uh, to assist. And of course, um, we're we're into just a little bit of everything: aircraft sales and acquisitions, you know, heavy airframe maintenance, heavy avionics, component repairs, and of course, engine, uh, paint, and interior, and of course, part sales. Uh, but we also do a lot of AOG services. So a lot of our smaller uh, satellite facilities that are close to the big airports assist a lot there as well. Um, again, here's the contact information for all of us. So if you've got some questions you want to uh, email us directly, here's our contact information. Um, the next slide is the question slide. And we actually, John, we did have a few more that popped up. And one of them was, can there be excessive amounts of ions pumped through the cabin? I mean, can you get too many ions? No, the, uh, there's been lots of studies that have been done. Again, if you go to uh, Niagara Falls, uh, if there was an excessive amount of ions, you wouldn't see people standing around Niagara Falls <laughs> trying to get the splendor of, of Niagara Falls. Um, our system is uh, continuously producing ions. We produce about three and a half million ions per cubic centimeter uh, every second. Um, ions live for about one to two minutes. So they, by that time, they, they'll either self-neutralize or they'll attach to a water molecule. Um, and, and fade off. So the, uh, the object with our system is, or objective with our system is to continuously produce ions so we're able to continuously uh, attack any pathogens, allergens, or contaminants in the aircraft. That makes total sense. Um, we did have just, you guys keep bringing these questions in right at the last minute, they're good. Um, Lewis had the one question about uh, Phenom 300. Now, I don't think there's an STC we have done. We're starting to branch out and doing some field approvals. Jonathan, do you know if we've done anything on a Phenom 300 yet? Because I don't think uh, we have it, Duncan. 
We don't have an STC for one yet. We do have several operators that are uh, uh, talking to various maintenance facilities. Uh, I believe your your organization included uh, to install it on a Phenom 300. It absolutely could be installed in a Phenom 300 uh, under a 337. Okay, perfect. Um, Erica had another good question, and I know this has come up with some of the disinfectants being used in the cockpit because some of the disinfectants, the avionics manufacturers are like, hey, don't be spraying that stuff up here. And so back to ionization, can I mean, can you use this in the cockpit? Does it affect avionics? Does it affect any of that electrical stuff? No. In fact, we were just tested uh, at the U.S. Air Force Research Lab. Uh, the Air Force currently is using a lot of our systems on board, many aircraft, and we're not supposed to say which ones, but uh, <laughs> from VVIP aircraft to cargo and transport aircraft. Uh, the, uh, and they, the, they have the Air Force Research Lab do specific studies um, on the system just to check specifically, one, that it did not create ozone, and we validated and verified from the U.S. Air Force that it does not create ozone. Two, okay. that it won't, won't affect the avionics or anything uh, from the aircraft, no EMR, RFI interference. Um, and then they've checked the eff efficacy of our system uh, mm -hmm. in pathogens. Um, mm -hmm. I know Erica also questioned if it's possible to get a copy of the uh, current COVID-19 test that we've performed from phase one. And I believe you guys have a copy of that. I think uh, you'd be more than welcome to, to share that with Erica. It is, I believe, actually attached on the documents of the uh, webinar here on the files. Um, the uh, people tuning in can actually download it straight from this presentation. Um, so that's good there. So I think that's going to wrap up. I think we've got a few other questions that we can uh, answer offline that are uh, pretty specific. Um, Dr. Rachel Sippy, thank you so much for tuning in to, or helping us out on, on a subject that most of us aviation guys do not know. You've been on a few calls with us, kind of just educating the company as well. So I can't thank you enough for bringing your expertise uh, to, to our company. And hopefully we didn't lose her. We might have lost her. And uh, Jonathan, again, thanks for the amazing product that we're putting into these aircraft and, uh, and all the testing you're going through. I know getting a COVID-19 virus probably wasn't the easiest thing to do. You know, it's uh, it, it, fi finding a laboratory, one that was qualified and legal to be able to uh, to test it was very, very difficult. There's only a few in the United States that, uh, that have that uh, ability. Uh, and then finding one that would... Uh, was willing to work with our system. I think so far we're about the only company I know that was able to find a lab and positively identify the fact that our system was able to neutralize the COVID-19 virus. Yeah, okay, no worries. Well, with that, we're gonna wrap up, save you guys some time. Thank you for tuning in to another webinar uh, from Duncan Aviation. And again, we'll leave up this slide just for a little bit, just in case you've got some questions, you can email us directly about the ACA system or anything else uh, that uh, you need on your aircraft. And from there, if you have some other ideas of some webinars or things that we should cover, leave those in the comments sections as well. And with that, you guys have a great week. We'll talk to you later. Thanks.